Yes, yes. Quick prayer, quick prayer. Yeah, you can play whatever you want. And when I do a call to worship, you can just keep playing. That's fine. Hello, ACES family. Welcome to our Saturday night service. Glad to see you all in person. And also, if you're joining us on our live stream, we are, we're glad you're able to, to be with us. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 2, and as I read, I'd like to invite you to stand. This is my, uh, this is my go-to psalm when the world feels kind of crazy. It just puts things into perspective that God is on his throne and in control and not surprised by anything that might be happening and might be worrying us. This is, uh, this is my go-to. So Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. We don't have to worry because Jesus is on the throne. He is the king, reigning forever. So we take rest in that. We take hope and peace in that. And so we're going to sing about the reasons we can, we can still bless his name. In spite of our circumstances, we can still sing his praises. So join us as we sing together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing.
on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and for being here with us for Oasis Contemporary Worship on Saturday afternoon at Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. And welcome to those of you who are with us live streaming or watching us later on Facebook or on our um, YouTube channel. It's good to be with you today. If you're viewing online and you'd like to be part of the Oasis community that way, we send out a weekly e-blast, and you can get on the mailing list for that by contacting us at info at zionfm.org. If you have a prayer request for Thanksgiving that you would like us to include in the upcoming Saturday service, please email that to me at pastorhank at zionfm.org, and we'll see that it gets in the prayers for the next Saturday. For those of you who are with us in person, uh, we'd ask that you use the uh, sign-in folders, which are on the chairs. Uh, there should be one fairly close to you. And if you are a first-time guest, we would appreciate if you would uh, complete that for us. If you have a prayer request for Thanksgiving, there are sheets inside the folder. And on there, you can either put your request for Thanksgiving, and these can be anonymous. And we'll collect those when we gather the offering. 
and then we'll add those to the prayers this morning, ah, this afternoon. Today we conclude our series of messages on I want to believe, but. We're going to explore why some people think God is a killjoy and what God is really like. Our guest preacher is Reverend Will Murphy, the associate pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Bonita Springs. We begin our looking at that topic and that theme from Scripture by praying. Loving Father, evil can seem so glamorous, and sin beckons us as a forbidden pleasure. Send your Spirit to point us to the true joy we have in Jesus our Savior, who lives and rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Why do we sin? Often it's because Satan holds out the idea that sinning will bring us joy or pleasure. But sin, without God's intervention, the Apostle Paul writes, leads to death. Instead, we find true joy and life when we live in the grace, the undeserved love of Jesus that we receive through his death and resurrection for our forgiveness. And Paul says, baptism assures us of that grace. We read from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. As Jesus began his ministry, he quoted the Old Testament prophet Isaiah to show that he brought true joy as he helped others, because Jesus was the promised Savior or Messiah. Luke chapter 4. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Y'all done messed up now. You gave me an open mic, and I don't have to come back next week, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> uh, before we uh, jump into this text, before we talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and, and maybe for us that are already followers of Jesus, refute that idea that God is a giant killjoy, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, 
what a joy it is that we are able to gather and worship together this evening. To proclaim the good news to each other, to hear that good news proclaimed to us, or that in and through Jesus Christ there is new life, there is freedom from sin, or that there is hope in the resurrection. This evening I pray that you equip me to proclaim that good news faithfully, that you open the hearts of everyone here, that we may hear it, that it may dwell in us, that it may change us, transform us, Lord, in such a way that we can go and proclaim that good news to others. And I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Um, you are in my all in all. I thank you for doing that. That was like a pull back to my high school youth group experience. That pulled me right back. Like I was like I was flooded with memories. I remember singing that like at youth camp. So it's kind of crazy to think that that song is almost thirty years old now. Like time flies. Um, and I'm, I'm as I was sitting there singing, I'm I'm trying to be present, but I'm also remembering all of these moments of me coming to faith in my youth group, and some of them that were amazing, and some of them that I look back at and just sort of, um, I cringe. I really do. Actually, just, you know, before we even jump in, uh, just if you don't know, I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna do you a favor here. I'm gonna introduce you to a really fun Gen Z term that has sort of taken over. You, you guys know what it means to cringe, right? So I don't know if you know this, but that word is no longer a verb. Did you know that? It's not a verb. It's an adjective now, right? So something doesn't make you cringe. Something is cringe. All right? You tracking with me so far? So have you guys seen things that are cringe in your life? Okay, so as I'm, I'm hearing this song, You Are My All in All, like these cringe moments come back to me. And so one of the ones that really struck me was I remember being about 16 years old and going to a big bonfire. This, this, is, this is bad, and I'm shamed. It makes me sad, okay? Going to a big bonfire with a plastic bag filled with all of my secular CDs. Now, if you guys don't know what that means, secular means non-Christian music, which I still remember a young lady in my youth group saying, I don't listen to secular music. I listen to Christian and country, and that's it. And we had to explain to her, darling. I had my plastic bag full of, of secular CDs, and I had great CDs, and I had Smashing Pumpkins in there, which is a phenomenal melancholy and the infinite sadness, which is a phenomenal double album. I had Red Hot Chili Peppers, I had Metallica, I had quite the collection, and I threw them all into the bonfire as a proclamation that I wasn't going to, to give my heart to this secular music. And I remember other things we did. I remember a girl that I dated that they had, a, they had a casting out event where they went through the home to find demonic things in their house, and one of which was a bottle of perfume called seduction. And they threw it into the fire, and it exploded in a ball of green fire. And they said, that's it! Clearly there was a demon! Because they didn't understand science and that certain things burn green. I cringe at that, I do. I look back and I, I cringe at the God's gem shirt that I wore with the most jacked, ripped Jesus that you had ever seen. Because when I was in high school, you didn't want to worship a wussy Jesus that would just lay down and die, right? It really, it's amazing to me the things that I, I gave up and the things that I, I loved and enjoyed, like my CD collection or like some of the movies that I enjoyed, um, all in this, this effort to be a better follower of Jesus. I had just come to faith. And the environment that I grew up in, to be a follower of Jesus, really meant that you had to live a certain way. I mean, that was the primary focus. And, and the cool thing about that, if, if you don't know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, was this explosion of Christian subculture that, that I was just right primed to be a part of. And the foundation of this Christian subculture was that, hey, we're just as fun as all those other guys out there, right? We're just as cool as them. And so we had our whole, our whole coterie of, of, like, if you like Marilyn Manson, here's the Christian version of Marilyn Manson. And you could have that CD. And we had all of these cheap versions of bands that we liked or cheap versions of movies that we liked. We had these cheap alternatives of a culture that we were desperately chasing after to prove that we were still fun and cool. We had our cheap celebrities. I remember that we just would fawn over Kurt Cameron and Scott Baio to say, see, they're Christians too. We're cool. We're fun. 
And it really, really strikes me as I look back and just cringe at the way that I understood the world because I thought at the time that if I just did everything right, if I could follow the rules well enough, as a follower of Jesus, if I could give up the right things, wear the right clothes, avoid the swear words that I wasn't supposed to say, get rid of the R-rated movies out of my house, I could grow closer to God, I could just work my way, way there. I think probably the most beautiful distillation of that is actually a cartoon series for kids called Veggie Tales. And you guys have probably seen that too. And really what it was was this idea of cartoon vegetables sharing good, important moral lessons so that way we could shape our kids in good, righteous behavior and make them more moral and make them more, more prone to follow after Jesus. And, and we did that to all culture. I think we still do. Our theme this evening is I want to believe, but a killjoy God. And I think in many ways, if we want to understand why people struggle believing with a God that loves them, a God that isn't just a killjoy God, we've, we've got to point the finger at ourselves first. I told you I get to say whatever I want. You may never invite me back. But I think as the people of God, when we have this conversation about why people don't want to believe, or why maybe you're here today and you're like, I want to believe, but... We have to look at ourselves first. I think that experience that I had coming into faith, that experience I had about chasing after righteousness, chasing after what it means to be a good person, really came down to this, that being a follower of Jesus was all about leading a good moral life. In fact, I would say for many of you coming into church, coming to know Jesus is really just the entry point into Christianity, and that the outcome is leading a good life moral life. And so we want to have good cultural touchstones and celebrities that lead good moral lives, and we want to have good educational standards that teach our kids to have good moral lives and good services that teach us how to be better husbands and better wives and better parents so we can lead better moral lives. And we end up creating a culture that is totally focused on how good we can be, how moral we can be. We end up with a culture that I would say in the eyes of our community, very much like my bag of CDs thrown to the fire is, guys, it's cringe. It's absolutely cringe. We end up with a culture that people would rather die than being associated with. We end up with a, a culture that is, that is just bound up into a moral code that says as long as you do the right things, you can get your get-out-of-hell card at the end of life, that you can cash in as long as you do it right, that we can be our best selves, that we could, uh, that we could change our lives for the better. In fact, I can tell you now as a pastor, I'm sure this is probably true for you, Hank, how many times have we heard someone come to us and say, if only my son would come to know Jesus, then maybe he would quit drinking. If only my daughter would come to Jesus, then maybe she would be nicer to her kids. Because we treat it, we treat it as a moral code to live by. And if you make your faith all about your moral code, your moral life, there's no joy in that. Because you can never be moral enough. There's always more things you can dig up. You can never be good enough. You can't do it. And so here's the thing. If I wrapped up now, if you only had one thing, that I want you to take with me, or take with you as you lead today. If there's only one thing you write down, I want it to be this. I want you to remember this, that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That is the heart of the gospel for us. He didn't make to come, come to make bad people good, but dead people alive. In fact, one of our earliest theologians, a guy named Irenaeus, who I'm sure you're all super familiar with, right? Got him on your, on your shelf now. Irenaeus writes, The glory of God is man made fully alive. What a beautiful sentiment to hold on to. Or as Paul says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Not in a new life, in the newness of life. 
The message of the gospel, the lives that we are called to live, is one marked not by how good we can behave, by how well we can pray, or give, or attend church, or vote, or dress, but instead is marked by a life that is renewed by a person made fully alive. And when you experience that, when the Holy Spirit works on you, when Christ breaks into your life that way, it does change everything. Some folks that have known me for a long time know that I've had some health issues in the past, a little bit, sort of. In 2008, I almost died. Not like, you know, you like had that near death, thing. oh, I almost died. No, like, I almost died. Like, I almost drowned in my own blood. It was crazy. Uh, I had an autoimmune disease, my lungs filled up with blood, my kidneys failed, and I was in the hospital for 48 days. 48 days. It was crazy. And here's the funny thing. It's amazing what God did for me in those 48 days, how he changed my life, how he brought me so close to death that finally I was ready to actually sit down and read scripture honestly and earnestly for the first time in my entire life. And it's amazing how after those 48 days, when I came out, even though I was still healing, the world seemed totally different. One, on a very practical note, <laughs> you may not realize this, but those painted lines on the road are just painted lines, and when you haven't been driving for a month and a half and you hop back out on there, you realize the cars that are coming towards you, it's totally on an honor system. That's the only thing keeping them. And that really hit me, because the world was like so new, and I realized, oh my gosh, I hadn't really experienced the world. I'd just taken for granted how things were. I remember, I remember as I got better that I was changed so much. I remember being in the subway for the first time and somebody was doing a terrible job at placing an order in front of me and I started to get irritated. And I found myself going, Lord, thank you that I'm irritated. That I'm, I'm actually here to experience irritation for the first time. So, question for you. If, if it's not about a moral code, right? If being a follower of Jesus isn't about being a good person, then what are we supposed to do, right? Not, not even try? Just give up? Do whatever we want? There's plenty of people that claim to be Christians that do that, right? They say, I'm one of those cool Christians that can get hammered on Saturday night. I was one of those at one time, too. No. No, not at all. Or, I mean, the words of Paul, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No. So we know that our faith is not about a moral code. So then what is our faith about? Yes, it's about being made alive. If it's not about a moral life, then what are we supposed to do with sin? Well, faith is about freedom. The entire letter of Paul's to the Romans is about working this group of people in Rome, this sort of mixed church folks that are in the Jewish faith, folks that are coming to faith in Christ, and, and navigating what you're supposed to do to be good enough. Who belongs? Who fits in? What are you supposed to do? And Paul keeps hammering the same point home over and over again. Don't you know that in and through Jesus Christ, yes, you're made alive, but you're also set free because before Jesus, you were enslaved. You were trapped. You were trapped by sin. And I think when we start to ask the question, when a lot of people say, well, I want to believe, but God's kind of a killjoy, when we start to peel back the layers, even in our own lives, what we're really saying is there's probably some sin in our lives that we don't want to give up yet. That there is probably things in our lives that are addictive, powerful, holding on to us that we're not ready to let go of and we're really afraid to believe because we're afraid that we might have to give up that thing that brings us security or identity or value. Things like power, control, money, pleasure. For me, I can tell you um, there's nothing that will make me feel guiltier than sitting in the drive through line at Culver's knowing it's killing me. I joke, but for many of us, it's that too. Fear. Those things that hold on to us, that make us feel safe, but ultimately have us trapped in a cycle that leads to death. In fact, in our sins, we're already dead. 
but in and through Jesus Christ, we have freedom. And we look at that Luke passage, which I think is beautiful when he's teaching in the synagogue and they say, what's the good news? The good news is this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Or as Paul says, trying something different tonight, doing the iPad Bible, getting fancy. That we are no longer enslaved to sin, for one, has, one who has died has been set free from sin. It is a beautiful thing to know that in and through Jesus Christ we have freedom. It's another thing to be able to actually let that take root in our lives and live in it. To know that everything that we've held on to in and before Jesus Christ is just, just a trap. And it's addictive and it is powerful and sin is powerful. And I think too often we underestimate the power of sin in our lives. We don't give enough credence to how powerful sin actually is. And in fact, I think often when we get into the subculture of the church that I mentioned earlier, we like to drag that sin right with us. Try to bring all of that works. We call it in the church, churchy term is works righteousness. To prove our goodness. To take it all back there. To set up the rules and regulations to make sure that everybody can fit into the mold. But Paul says this, no, we are dead to sin. We've been set free. And I'm going to be honest with you, one thing that shocks me consistently now having done this for 10 years is how many people have been set free and then continue to reconstruct the prison cell that they left. It's amazing to me that we have real freedom in and through Jesus Christ. We say, yes, I know he set me free, but man, this prison cell, it was cozy and I like it. And I'd like to stay, please. And in fact, I would like the church to be shaped in such a way that you don't wreck that cell. Could you please? Could you accommodate my love of money and my love of power? Could you not preach on something that's going to make me question maybe my adherence to certain ideologies? And so we want to hold on to that. And I want to tell you this, that in and through Jesus Christ, you actually have freedom from that. You have the opposite of defeat. You have real, true, and new life. My prayer for you, as I wrap up tonight, is this, that you will recognize that in and through Jesus Christ, you have absolute freedom and that there is nothing more joyful than actually having true freedom from what is held on to you. So I said I was one of those Christians that, that was one of the cool Christians. I can tell you that that same time I was in the hospital, for years before that, I don't even think I've told this story at Hope. This is funny. So I told you I get to, I get to have fun with you guys. I wanted to be one of those Christians where I said, you know what, I can be a follower of Jesus and hold on to all of my sin. And I thought that my sin at the time was I was going to drink myself to death. I was pretty good at it, too. I mean, you probably saw my name is Will Murphy. So it's, it's genetic. No, I'm joking. But the reality was I thought that I had an addiction to alcohol at the time. I really did because, man, I could pound them down. I really could. I was good at it. And it wasn't until 2007 when I got into a terrible car accident. Stone sober, just random car accident, that all my friends came around and said, wow, that's horrible. Had you been drinking? I said, no, I hadn't been. And over the next year, as I processed and got geared up to get sick all over again in 2008, I... Um, I realized that actually the real thing that I held on to, the sin that I held on to, was anger. That I had built up a God that expected something of me to be perfect. I went to school to be a, a worship leader at the time. I went to school to be, actually the major was sacred music. It's a little shaggy dog. This is not the wrap-up I had, but sometimes something clicks, and I just want to share this with you. And I was absolutely enslaved how angry I was that God had set this barrier for me that I could not achieve, could not keep up with. I was absolutely furious that God would put me in a situation where I knew I would fail. That God put me in a situation where my parents couldn't support me in the way that I thought they should, and so I was angry at them. I was angry at Jesus for not answering prayers that I thought he should answer. And it wasn't until I almost died in 2008 that 
God was able to finally dig that anger out. And it wasn't until then I finally experienced what true freedom looks like. And guys, I'm going to be honest with you, I fail every day. You're going to as well. We have new life in Jesus, but we are still caught in these broken vessels. But I want to tell you this, and this is the uniquely Lutheran thing that, that you're not going to get everywhere else. That we're going to take a part of the Lord's Supper tonight. That we're going to come up here and we're going to have forgiveness that we're going to hold in our hands. Taste and touch. That we're going to have forgiveness of sins. That in and through Jesus Christ, you are still made new. Nothing you have to do. No special prayer you have to pray. But just out of his great love and mercy through his abundant grace, you are called into new life. And it is my prayer for you tonight that that sticks that holds, that you take comfort in it, and that it brings you true joy. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are so good. And we know that in and through your Son, we have been given new life. Lord, that we have been given something to be joyful about, that we are no longer dead in our sins, but made fully alive this evening. I pray that you let that good news take root in our lives, that it blossoms, that it blooms, that it takes over. Lord, we know that in and through Jesus Christ, you have set us free from sin. And Lord, where that sin holds on, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you continue to dig it out, till up that space, that more of you may take root in our hearts that we may continue to glorify you, yes, Lord, but be made fully alive, that we may remember that it's not about how good we can be, but about how good you are, that it is not how much we could do, but about what you did at the cross. Lord, we thank you that you are who you are, and I pray that that good news takes root in us, and Lord, that it continues to strengthen us now and always. Praise the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. During the next song, we will pass the offering plate uh, to gather offerings and prayer requests. And if you've not used the sign-in folder at, as of yet, please do so at this time. We sing our song of response.
Our statement of faith uh, is drawn from the explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed, that article, that part of the Creed which talks about the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in the church. The words will be on the screens. We rise to say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son and my Lord. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus as my Savior or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, the Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, the Spirit will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Please be seated. We've just gathered our offerings here among our in-person worshipers. If you're with us online and you would like to also have the act of worship of making an offering, that can happen in two ways. You can mail that to the Zion Church office in the form of a check, or you can use electronic transfer. But whatever you choose to do, you're invited to be part of our offerings today. We pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the prayers. All wise and ever knowing God, you sent your Son to save us when we were lost and wandering spiritually, saddened in our sins. Point us to the true joy we can have through thankful hearts when your grace is at work in our lives. Good Father, we pray for guests in our worship today in this space and tomorrow morning in our sanctuary. Welcoming Jesus, bless their time with us, that they may rejoice in your presence with them as they are here with us. We pray for those not with us in worship this weekend, including all who travel. God of the highways and byways, send your angels to guide those who are away from home with your protection and peace. Lord of the nations, we pray for our country, especially in these days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we pray for the people of Ukraine. Bless the leaders of this world and our nation with humble hearts listening ears and wisdom as they seek to serve the country in which they live and the world which we share. We pray for individuals who seek healing, those persons we know with medical and other needs whom we now name silently in our hearts. Be present with all who struggle with addiction bring relief to those who suffer pain or discomfort each day in body, mind, or spirit. Great physician, your son Jesus took our pain upon himself for our sake. We ask your blessing upon endeavors to contain the coronavirus. Guard those who have been risking their own health to treat the infected. Bless their efforts and whatever we can do so this pandemic may be tamed. Lord of life, we also, besides the people of Ukraine, lift up others who suffer because of warfare in their countries. And be with victims of natural disasters around the world, such as in Madagascar. Guide your people as they sink to, re to bring relief to refugees, food to the starving, and medical care to those afflicted by plagues. Be with our sisters and brothers in Christ at Mount Pleasant Missionary Baptist Church here in Fort Myers. Strengthen our partner congregation in the Florida, Georgia district, Hope Lutheran Church in Bonita Springs. 
Bless us here at Zion, too, during this 50th anniversary. Lead us to grow in faith in Jesus, in witnessing to him as our Savior, in serving others in this community and beyond in his name, and in caring for one another as people brought together by Jesus. Guide our hearts to be thankful for the little things in life which we often take for granted, such as the delicate taste of brioche with chocolate chips, brake lights to alert us when the vehicle ahead of us is stopping, and the interesting sight of an anhinga flapping its wings to get dry. Thank you for all your blessings in our lives. We bring this prayer to you, good Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today we have focused on how God offers us real joy in life, even when Satan seeks to lure us into sin by promising pleasure. We need to be reminded of the source of true joy because sometimes we fail to look at Christ and sin as we instead seek pleasure in this life. And this afternoon we are assured that such sin and all sins are forgiven. When Jesus gave the Lord's Supper to his disciples, he promised that as we receive his body with the bread and his blood with the wine, we also receive forgiveness of sins, which he won through sacrificing his body for us. So we can come to the Lord's table today to be assured that our sins, whatever they may be, have been forgiven by God. Because of this promise, we prepare for receiving communion this day by confessing to the Lord God. We pause for personal, silent confession of sins in our hearts. The Apostle John writes in his first letter, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, because the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Because Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave with new life for you, I follow his command to me as a called and ordained servant of the word, and I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please hold up your mini chalice as we celebrate that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now, as the table prayer for our Lord's Supper, we use our Lord's Prayer. We say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Please take your mini chalice and unseal the part which has the wafer in it. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for all your sins. And then unsealing the other side of the chalice. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for the forgiveness of all your sins.
may this true body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ make you strong and keep you in the true faith until the life never ending. Go in peace with joy. Amen. We pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that through the Lord's Supper you assure us that we are truly members of your family, the Church. And we ask that you would use this sacrament to strengthen us in our faith in you and to increase our love for one another. We pray in the name of Jesus, who gave himself for us, seeking the presence and peace of your spirit. Amen. Thank you for being here for in-person worship this afternoon, and thank you to those of you who are with us online. We can't see you, but we think of you, and we're glad you're here too. Next Saturday, we begin a Lenten weekend sermon series with the theme, Winning the War in Your Mind. Various temptations can lead us to thoughts which result in act, acting in ways that grieve our Savior. We'll learn how the Apostle Paul points to God's help for winning the war, the struggle in our minds with these temptations. Now receive this blessing. God, go before you to lead you, behind you to protect you, beneath you to support you, and beside you to befriend you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace and power of Christ to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for our closing song. And our hearts are prone to wonder, overcome by apathy, losing sight of what most matters. Well, there's a joy that's abounding, and the peace overflowing from your heart to the broken. So we sing hallelujah, see the walls that are breaking in the sun. Stand in your presence, we will shout hallelujah. And our strength is wearing thin, and our faith is dry like deserts. He is working deep within, filling up the empty system. The joy that's abounding and the peace overflowing from your heart to the broken. So we sing hallelujah, see the walls that are breaking, hear the sound of waking. When we stand in your presence, we will share. Bye, bye.